I am especially grateful uh, to be here, honored to be a part of this, uh, this lecture. When Dr. Thomas did ask me if I would come and do this, I said, I, I would love to come, just sort of one caveat, I just need you to know up front, I don't own a pair of dress shoes, this is a fact. So is it going to be okay if I just wear basketball shoes? It's really the only thing I have these days. So I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here. Um, listen, I, I love spending time on college campuses. Uh, he mentioned my time at uh, Palm Beach Atlantic University in sunny South Florida. Uh, I absolutely love my time in college. Uh, I step onto this campus and I begin to get some of those same vibes and feelings that I had way back then, uh, though admittedly with a little bit of a little bit of contrast, uh, right? Uh, you know, in, in South Florida, for instance, at Palm Beach Atlantic, uh, we had miles and miles of beaches and ocean. Y'all have miles and miles of just like planes and stuff. And I came in, I, I thought I saw a mountain, and then I noticed there were birds all around. It was actually a big trash pile. And I was like, what on earth is going on? Um, but also, even as, as my time as a student at Palm Beach Atlantic, uh, I can vividly remember sitting in my dorm experiencing this contrast firsthand. I can remember as a poor college student eating ramen noodles, and I looked outside of my dorm window, and there was Donald Trump's yacht sitting in the intercoastal waterway. You guys feel this here, right? I mean, you come here and you, you all know Dr. Thomas, you know and love him, and, and you kind of get this contrast with him of these amazing European fashion sensibilities and that every day he comes into work in this big red duck dynasty pickup truck, and it just reminds us of, of a little bit of the, the dissonance that we have to experience. But no, I am especially grateful, uh, like I said, to be here. Listen, college is, uh, is a formative time uh, in your education as it was for me. Uh, I can remember for, for me that one of the blessings of college was uh, it actually disconnected me to a degree from my home and disconnected me from my local church family as I went off to college. And this was very important for me because it gave me an opportunity to really probe the depths of my own beliefs, right? Not so much what it was that my parents believed or my pastor or my church believed, but what does, what does Stephen Ecker actually believe? And those experiences at college have, have very much shaped the way that I teach. It really has oriented my ministry at, at Southeastern Seminary, whether I'm dealing with master's students or college students. And what I try to do is I try to get my students to basically consider three questions that I would invite you to consider here as well today. First, the question, what do I believe? What, what is it that you actually believe about the faith and about life? about truth. Not just what do you believe, but why do you believe those things? What is, the, what is the authority in your life that is undergirding those beliefs? And then third and finally, a question that I think all too often we fail to answer or even consider, and that is, what am I willing to give up or what am I willing to endure for those beliefs that I actually hold? You see, whether you know it or not, each of you is asking each of these three questions here during your time at OBU. And so when, when you're not tooling around, for instance, playing Nerf Zombie uh, with Dr. Emerson, the culture and the context that you have here, you're actually, you're actually considering these questions whether you know it or not. What do you believe? Why do you believe them, these things? And what are you willing to give up for those beliefs? And really, here's the simple fact. The answers that you come up with to those questions, they're going to cast a long influence, a shadow, if you will, either positively or negatively upon your life as you consider a whole host of other questions, like what you're going to do with your life, how you're going to relate to other people. There is really much at stake with these questions. And so if, if this seems frightening, if, if these questions seem daunting, uh, take heart. The reality is we're not alone in this. And Christians for literally hundreds and hundreds of years have been considering these same three questions. In fact, exactly 500 years ago, in 1519, the German reformer Martin Luther considered these three questions as well 
and pondered them at the Leipzig debate of 1519. And the landscape of Christianity was changed forever. Now, in order to demonstrate the importance of this Leipzig debate on the anniversary of Leipzig, and to help us to sort of orient our minds around these three questions, these three seminal questions, what I want to do is move back in time to two of the most important moments in Martin Luther's life uh, and to consider them as a springboard to our larger discussions relating to uh, this issue uh, of authority. So let's begin then with an examination of these two important times. So on a chilly winter day in Wittenberg, Germany, on the 10th of December, 1520, the German reformer Martin Luther, he publicly burned a papal bull for, that was issued by Pope Leo X, famously known as Exurge Domini. It was a bull that had threatened Luther with excommunication from the church. And, and that bull wasn't the only thing that he set ablaze that day. With a throng of agitated supporters present surrounding him, Luther also publicly burned copies of Roman Catholic canon law, copies of scholastic textbooks, and the writings of the famed Roman Catholic apologist Johann Eck. We will meet Eck in our discussions formally in just a bit. And with every crackle of the fire that burned those works. Luther's defiance of the Roman Catholic Church's authority, it rang forth more loudly than the hammer clangs that had started this entire drama just a few years earlier in 1517 when Martin Luther posted his very famous 95 Theses. Now, a fear four months after this bonfire, right, Luther also now stood before the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V at a famous imperial diet at Worms. He had now been formally excommunicated by the church, and an imperial inquiry into Luther's views had brought the reformer to this very tenuous and very dangerous moment in his life. And as Charles V watched closely, Luther's inquisitors afforded him one final chance to recant his teachings to capitulate under the weight of imperial authority. And yet, Luther's response, it was bold, it was defiant. You could say it was arguably the most famous words of his entire corpus. Listen to what Luther says. He replied, unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by clear reason... I am bound by the scriptures. My conscience is captive to the word of God. In that climactic moment with, with life and death presumably hanging in the balance for Luther, his resolve was unwavering. His commitment to the, the word of God, the, the authoritative anchor to all he knew to be true, it helped to steady him amidst a conflict, a conflict of the storms in his life. You see, by the fateful day in 1521 at Worms, when he stood before the emperor, Luther had considered all three of our aforementioned questions, and he had come to conclusions on all three of them. What did Luther believe? Well, simply put, Luther believed the gospel. He believed the beautiful picture in the Bible that is set forth of God redeeming for himself a people, that humanity is made right before God. That is, we are justified by God's grace through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. Listen, if you've not come to realize that in your own life, that is the most important question that you need to deal with more pressing than any of these other questions. And again, it will shape and direct not only your time here at college and in your life, but it will shape all of eternity. So Luther believed the gospel. Most importantly, to what extent did he believe the truth about the gospel? Well, we saw this time and again in Luther's life in his bold and public defiance of authorities standing for what he knew to be true about the gospel. Luther had uh, 
tasted of salvation personally. He had drunk from the living waters that Jesus spoke about, and he never got over it. And yet, how? How had Luther come to that belief about the gospel and and with such deep and abiding convictions? Why not simply listen to what the church was telling him to do? You see, this time period in Luther's life, it was his college moment, you could say, where he began to ask deep questions in his very heart and his mind and his soul about what it was that he believed, not what others believed. And so why, why was he willing to do this? Well, for an answer to those questions, to consider how it is that he had come to this belief, we're going to step back in time again to 1519, to that famous debate at Leipzig that I mentioned. For it was here at Leipzig that that Luther began to more fully understand this emerging Protestant doctrine called sola scriptura. And it's to that doctrine that we will really invest the bulk of our time here together. And so the purpose of this time really is to ask, what does sola scriptura mean? To consider what Luther meant by the doctrine, especially as it relates to the intersection of both scripture and tradition, and to think through how those relate to one another. And as Luther's understanding of sola scriptura becomes more clear for us today, it is my hope that each of you in this room here today, that you will see how crucial it is to allow the Bible to serve as the normative authority in your lives. And that we will let the text of Holy Scripture to frame the answers to the most important questions that you and I will ever pose and ponder. And that as well, we'll be able to better, more humbly relate to others as they may not share our beliefs, and yet we're called to live missionally and in a God-honoring way. So let's begin thinking through the stirring of controversy that led up to this debate in 1519. Well, Luther's Reformation, with its central focus on a theology of the cross, it shook the, the landscape of Christendom to its core. And this challenge that Luther presented to the Roman Catholic Church's authority, uh, it, it, it really unfolded over time. We think, for instance, about the importance of the 95 Theses, and it was important, and yet the 95 Theses was simply Luther asking questions about the church, specifically asking questions about the sale of indulgences, for instance. In short, the question was this. Is forgiveness, is the forgiveness of God even saleable? Is it a monetary commodity? For greater concern for Rome was not questions about indulgences. It was questions about Luther's persistent questions and charges and criticisms of the church's authority. Papal indulgences, you see, they were but a symptom of a much more systemic, deeper problem during the early modern period. Now, the church's first official replies to Luther's concern about indulgences came from a man named Sylvester Mazzolini, called Prierius, through his late 1518 work entitled Dialogue Concerning the Power of the Pope. Now, in this stinging condemnation of Luther's 95 Theses, Prieris contended, and I quote, whoever says regarding indulgences that the Roman church cannot do what it de facto does is a heretic. And Prieris even ceded that papal indulgences were not found in the Bible. But that didn't matter. The words of Scripture didn't matter. The words of the Pope did. His voice was binding, even superseding that of Holy Writ. And Prierius was not alone in his criticism and his concern about Luther. Tommaso de Vallo, who we formerly know as Cardinal Cayetan, uh, during his time in 1518 examining Luther, uh, 
at Augsburg in the early throes of the controversy of the Reformation, he affirmed there the church's use of papal indulgences, again, not because of the words of Scripture, but because of Pope Clement VI's binding declaration from a bull in the middle of the 14th century. And yet, even for Luther, this early date in his reforming career, something about the very foundation of belief being based upon the authority of the Pope and seeing that authority as superseding the Scriptures, something about that for Luther seemed awry and off. In fact, in 1518, replying to Cayetan's claims at Augsburg, he referenced Paul's words in Galatians chapter 1. Remember in the beginning of Galatians, Paul's talking about their other Gospels, which Paul would say are, of course, no Gospels at all. So let, referencing that, this is what Luther says. He says, the Pope was not above, was under the Word of God. And yet for all of his questions, Rome was undeterred in its understanding of church tradition. And once Pope Leo X reaffirmed Rome's official stance on indulgences without a single appeal to the Bible in a 1518 bull, the battle lines were drawn formally in the sand. And six months later, the call for an imperial diet, a debate at Leipzig, was set three months later. Now, to be fair, right, the debate at Leipzig was anything but a spellbounding moment in time. These, are, these debates are not exactly exciting, and yet, Two moments between Luther and his chief protagonist at Leipzig, a man by the name of Johann Eck, a Roman Catholic apologist. They produced dramatic sparks. In fact, the impact of their verbal clash at Leipzig, they sent reverberating waves that, that not only impacted that debate, but it helped to reshape the landscape of Christianity as we know it today. Now, from the outset at this debate, Eck baited Luther, he enticed Luther to consider this question of the church's authority. Eck thought this was an area that Luther might be especially susceptible and ultimately could prove to be his undoing. And Luther took the bait. And he waded into a discussion with Eck about the nature of authority. And here, Eck used not only the Bible but also the church fathers to frame and cast a, an understanding of papal authority. Luther simply referenced the Bible. In fact, very famously, he used two texts. Matthew chapter 16, that, that famous passage of, of, of Peter's confession of Christ, the keys to the kingdom passage, and as well, John chapter 21. Remember, this is where three times Jesus reminds Peter to feed my sheep. Luther references these two passages, and he says there that these passages have nothing to do with Peter's own authority. They actually have to do with the authority of the church, specifically tied in with the church's faith. He then looks to that very famous passage in Matthew chapter 16 where, where Jesus calls to Peter and he says, Peter, you are this rock, this this Petros, and on this rock I will build my church. And what Luther says there is, he says, this idea of the foundation of the church, this is not linked to Rome. This has nothing to do with the Bishop of Rome. Rather, this has to do with identifying what the true church is founded upon. And here Luther simply cites two things. These would become very famously the two marks of the Protestant church. Well, what was that rock? Well, according to Luther, that rock was the preaching of the gospel and the right or proper administration of the sacraments. And still reeling from Luther's exegesis, which seems so strange to him, Eck soon changed his strategy at Leipzig, and on the 5th of July, 1519, Eck simply called Luther a Hussite a tactic that Craig Harline calls one of guilt by association. Now, Jan Hus was a famous 
early reforming figure from the 15th century. And Luther certainly was not in lockstep with him on all of these issues, but he, that is, Hus was a progenitor to Luther on the issue of authority, especially the idea of scriptural primacy. Yet Luther really was unaware of this this claim. He didn't know that there was a link that existed between him and Hus. And so at a debate, at, at a break during this debate in Leipzig, Luther begins to pour over the proceedings of the Council of Constance from 1415, where Hus was a participant. Based on that brief study, once the debate resumed, Luther publicly acknowledged an important shared conviction with the bohemian theologian Jan Hus. That conviction was that councils and the Pope not only could err, but historically have erred. And to prove his point, all he had to do was cite the Fifth Lateran Council that took place in 1517, the year that the whole drama started with the Reformation. And in that Fifth Lateran Council, it had not only overturned some of the, the proceedings of the Council of Constance that Hus was at, but it took the very famous Council of Basel and completely stripped it of its authoritative status. In other words, what Luther saw taking place here was he saw official church declarations that were competing and at odds or irreconcilable with each other. This for Luther meant one thing. The church was fallible. It could err. And based upon those findings, Luther asserted at Leipzig, quote, I am sure of this, that many of Huss's beliefs were completely evangelical and Christian, end quote. Now, with this defiant statement, a historical association between Luther and Hus had been made and seeded even by Luther himself. And once that was done, two very important things took place. Well, first of all, Eck had gotten Martin Luther to publicly align himself with Jan Hus. Oh, by the way, at the Council of Constance in 1415, Hus was declared a heretic by the church and ultimately burned at the stake. So Luther is now basically saying, I'm with this guy over here who the church had executed a hundred years earlier for heresy. And why had Hus been executed at Constance? He had challenged Rome's authority, the very same thing that Eck was now charging Luther with. Secondly, you could even say more importantly, Luther's interactions during the Leipzig debate, it helped to highlight a historical fault line, a division that existed between two different understandings and applications of the word tradition in the church's preceding history. And this important truth became more clearly defined in Luther's mind at Leipzig, and he was now entering into a dangerous time and uncharted waters. Yet he did so guided by this, this burgeoning Protestant idea, sola scriptura. But what does sola scriptura mean? Well, the encounter with Eck at Leipzig, it served as this important historical marker for Luther, setting him on a course with an unwavering, abiding conviction and dependence upon the Word of God as his authority. It also, brothers and sisters, offers to us a very important reminder about the unique place that the Bible should hold in our lives. You see, at Leipzig, what Luther came to realize was that the Bible, the text of Scripture, it is to be the normative authority in our lives. And he based this conviction really on the divine nature of the text. The Bible, because it is God's Word, because it's God-breathed and inspired, it is to be distinguished from mere human words. 
Accordingly, anything that the church says has to be subservient to, a servant to the more normative form of authority that is the Word of God. And this dependence on scriptural authority eventually became more acute became one of the reasons why the Reformation took place, because as, as Luther and the other Reformers begin to read this text, as they begin to look at what it said and what it taught, they began to see a massive disconnect between what this said and what the church was saying doctrinally and how it was functioning morally. They saw this huge gulf and divide between the two. As alluded to earlier, when thinking about Scripture, the word normative is key. The Bible is to be our normative authority, and yet it is not to be our only authority. Now, this normativity of the Bible, it certainly means that the Bible's teachings are normative for all of Christ's followers. Right, so, for instance, you take something as simple as Jesus' commands to love our neighbors or to preach the good news of the gospel. You realize those aren't just options. Those aren't suggestions. They are imperative calls of the Scripture for all believers. And here it is crucial to remember when you look at this phrase, sola scriptura, or scripture alone, that solo, I mean, that sola here is used not uh, for the notion or the idea of uh, exclusivity, but relating more to the idea of primacy or supremacy. I I love the way Timothy George has framed this, the, the dean at Beeson. Timothy George has astutely argued that sola scriptura was not nuda scriptura. It's not just scripture in isolation. Listen, Luther never thought that believers should simply cloister themselves away in hiding alone with a Bible, just reading and understanding the text on their own terms. Listen, nor should we. In fact, I tell my students all the time, if you you show me someone who wants to read and understand the Bible on their own, separated from their local church community and the historic church community of 2,000 years. If you show me that person, I will show you a person who is susceptible to wandering off into the wilderness of heresy. We cannot do this alone. So scriptural primacy, it it really is an important point to understand. For in the years following the Reformation, some have misunderstood and misapplied this idea of sola scriptura. Sadly, this is especially true in many Baptist circles, where some have misunderstood sola scriptura and have argued that any authority outside of the text of Scripture should be completely jettisoned or rejected. So, for example, very famously, Alexander Campbell suggested that something as important as the church's ecumenical creeds, that they are unbiblical. In fact, as he says, that they are, quote, necessarily heretical and schismatic. That is the church's creeds and confessions of faith. Others, like the historian Alistair McGrath, they have decried the effects of sola scriptura. Because of the theological chaos, because of the splintering of the faith into the the myriad of denominations that we have today, because we located authority in the text rather than in the broader tradition. Sadly, these critiques, they miss the heart of sola scriptura as Luther understood it. Here it should be stated, again, other sources of authority, they are crucial to finding and maintaining right doctrine with this one caveat. Those sources of authority are always subservient to and serve Scripture. And that, friends, that is the truth that Luther unwittingly stumbled onto at the Leipzig controversy. The the crux of the matter for us then really comes down to 
How are we going to define, how are we going to understand this nebulous thing called church tradition? What is church tradition? Well, listen, it is important to remember that whenever you're talking about theology, theology at its core is just simply words. (laughs) And and words uh, have meaning, but not always the same meaning to different people. So we understand then that historically this idea of church tradition, it has been polyvalent in meaning. That is, it has spoken and been understood to have different voices. Here, the historian Heiko Obermann has has helped us with some some really useful historical qualification for the term church tradition. Obermann cites a tripartite understanding of church tradition. Think about the phrase church tradition as being used in three different ways. The first way he cites as tradition one. That's what he calls it. For Obermann, what tradition one is, it affirms the supreme authority of Scripture. Scripture is sufficient. It's what we need. It is, as he says, it is the canon or standard of divine truth as revealed by God. Yet tradition one, as Obermann understood it, also in its affirmation of the sufficiency of Scripture, also highlights the way the church has historically passed down a traditional proper way of reading the scripture, a a hermeneutic, you could say, that has been passed down, especially going back to the apostles. We saw this in, in the early church, for instance, with Irenaeus. Irenaeus in his battle with the Gnostics. He stressed the importance of, of tradition, namely, interpreting the Bible, the text itself, in a manner which mirrored the early church fathers and the apostles before them. Thus, if you follow this interpretive pattern of the apostolic church, you would help the church to avoid from veering off into the Gnostic heresy that was so prevalent during Irenaeus' day. Now, while this tradition won, this affirmation of the text's sole and normative authority, but also using historically the church's interpretation of the text as a barometer, while it dominated the church's usage historically of the phrase tradition well into the medieval era, another way, a a different way of using that phrase church tradition rose to the fore in the late medieval period specifically around the 13th, 14th, and 15th centuries. Obermann calls this form of church tradition, tradition two. Listen, historians are not always the most creative in our terminology. This tradition two, you see, it still viewed the Bible as an authority, but it wasn't the only authority. You see, tradition two also took this authority and left it here, but it created a secondary form of authority, the church's voice. And this was based mostly on a belief that the church had during the late medieval period, its, its appropriation of scholasticism, where it said the text was not sufficient. And so where, where the Bible is either ambiguous or where it's unclear or where it's silent, The church then comes in as the second authority, and whether you're talking about the declarations of the Pope, ecumenical church councils, creeds, confessions of faith, the church then states what it believes. That is the church tradition that Luther was familiar with. Thus, church tradition for the late medieval period and Luther's time period at the start of the Reformation affirmed a dual fount view of revelation, the Bible and church tradition, as opposed to the earlier understanding, which saw the Bible as normative, and church tradition was then just simply an interpretation of the text based upon the apostles. Tradition zero, that brings us to the close of our tripartite understanding of tradition, Obermann Uh, simply cites is a rejection of both of these forms of tradition. You throw out the Bible, you throw out the church, and it's just you 
and the Holy Spirit. It's spirit-driven. It affirms a progressive view of revelation, and it is deeply personal in nature. It was not a very prominent view during the time of the Reformation, but sadly today, this is pervasive in our culture and in our churches. Think about the way we oftentimes think about making decisions on things like calling based simply upon our internal witness of the Holy Spirit without any consideration to others around us. Phrases like, the Lord told me to do this or God led me to do that is present all too often in our culture and too many times over has been demonstrated over time to be untrue. Now, despite the historic precedence of this tradition one, Luther lived in a world in which this tradition two, scripture and church tradition, dominated the ecclesiastical landscape. In fact, by the time Luther broached the issue of papal authority outside of scripture, there were some 1,500 Roman Catholic prescriptions outside of the text that people had to follow. It wouldn't take much to highlight the disconnect, the dissonance between these two authorities, the authority of the church and the authority of the Bible. So in the end, you see, the papal indulgences, they simply served as the contextual spark that forced Luther to reconsider what it was that the Bible said about things, specifically what it said about salvation. Yet indulgences and difference of opinion about the nature of the gospel, they were merely symptoms of a much more substantive and foundational problem. You see, at Leipzig, Luther's articulation of sola scriptura, it had quite literally unseated the Pope, and it had re-enthroned the Bible. Yet that shift in the ecclesiastical landscape, especially when coupled with his doctrine of the priesthood of, unbel- of all believers, it, it created unintended consequences. You see, even if you acknowledge the Bible's supreme authority and provide people access to the Bible, the Bible still has to be interpreted. And the Reformers quickly learned that not everyone read the Bible in the same way. Thus, for Luther, sola scriptura was tied to a broad theological community of interpretation. Well, why is this so important? Listen very carefully to me. Though the text of Scripture is inspired, our interpretations of the text are not. And that's an important point that we have to seed and we have to understand. And so in light of this, what Luther did is he recast church tradition as a handmaiden to Holy Scripture. And what Christians of previous generations have said is important to us, that matters. And they were the caretakers of orthodoxy, the ones who were passing the baton of the gospel down to the next generation. Luther focused attention here on what Scott Hendricks called the principle of consensus. That is, there existed a tiering of authority in which the Bible is normative, but there are other secondary interpretive voices from the past, such as the church fathers, ecumenical councils, and so on. Theirs was a collective voice that was unified in preserving the truth of the gospel and the one true faith as recorded in Scripture. In fact, this is what Luther said responding to Cardinal Cayetan back at that Augsburg debate in 1518. He said this, Today I declare publicly that I am not conscious of having said anything contrary to Holy Scripture, the Church Fathers, or papal decrees. All that I have said on this is sensible, true, and Catholic. Now, to be clear, this theological community that Luther was referencing, it didn't speak authoritatively to every question. I mean, questions about the exclusivity of, of Jesus or the bodily res- resurrection of Jesus, those are different questions than should we use pipe organs in worship? Now, the answer to that question is yes, but that's because I'm just a huge fan of pipe organs. The early church then 
use this idea of sola scriptura linked with the concept of the rule of faith. The rule of faith, you see, it was a summary of the biblical teachings that were handed down by the apostles. And so for Luther, sola scriptura meant taking into account what the church had collectively affirmed as expressed through the fathers, the creeds, and the ecumenical councils, and then using those historic voices, those voices from the past as a canon, or you could say like a measuring stick regarding doctrinal truth. And those historic voices then, they helped, they helped us, they helped the church to establish guardrails, edges, the boundaries, to identify the boundaries of orthodoxy and to keep Christians from veering into heresy. And when Luther took those measures uh, and began to apply it in his own context, the voices of those from the past cried out that the Roman church had overstepped. Now, Luther rightly leveraged this sola scriptura in his criticism of indulgences, but he also mistakenly applied it at times in his own life as well. Very famously in a debate in Marburg in 1529, Luther looked at some of his fellow reformers as heretics simply because they didn't believe like he did about the Lord's Supper. And Luther was hypocritical in his own application of this important doctrine. Now, the application for us on this should be pretty apparent. Brothers and sisters, we need voices from the past. It is naive for us to think that we can or should pass down the faith to the next generation without a connection to those Christians who have gone before us. It is sheer intellectual and historical hubris for us to assume that we have a better grasp on theology because of our place and time. It's actually a lie born of the Enlightenment. It's rooted in a self-absorbed anthropology. Our faith, it's a historic faith, and one that is not somehow elevated above or disconnected from the faith of those who have gone before us. And we are, like them, saved by the very same gospel of Jesus Christ. We can also learn from Luther's misapplication of sola scriptura. It is irresponsible for us to take our secondary and our tertiary commitments beyond those affirmed as orthodoxy through this historic principle and consensus and make others to believe like we do. It's in different readings of the Bible within the safe waters of orthodoxy, it's okay. It doesn't mean that there's some kind of satanic hostile takeover of the faith that's taking place. In the end, I like the way Kevin Van Hooser has summarized this. He says, Sola Scriptura is both a confession of faith that God's word is infallible, but it's also a confession of sin that our human interpretations are, by contrast, fallible. In other words, we need both humility and we need others as we read and apply the wisdom of Christ. We need this diverse historic community. That, friends, is both the beauty and the genius behind the doctrine of sola scriptura. So in conclusion, as we think about this, and we think about the various parties leaving from the Leipzig debate, all including Luther, they were oblivious to the fact that there was a monumental corrective that had been offered. They were also unaware of the fact that the very notion of Reformation, as we might understand it, it died at Leipzig. Two different competing views of authority would not allow the church to go forward without some form of division. There would be no Reformation, as the word implied, only separation and division. And yet Luther never desired fracture of the church, his criticisms were born of a love for the church. And so from Leipzig moving forward, the Bible served as the guiding light of the Reformation. The Reformers didn't know where this path was going to take them, but 
They knew they could trust the Bible to light their way. And my prayer for each of you, again, at what is this seminal moment in your own lives, when you're making decisions about belief that are going to set your trajectory for your life, that you will allow sacred scripture to be your guide, the light to all that you know to be true, and that you will embrace this historic community of interpreters. Now humbly just simply say, I need help in understanding the text of Scripture. And as the pressing authorities of modernity, they vie for your heart's affections and your mind's attention, may you leverage this great gift of God in the divine special revelation of Scripture as you answer the pressing questions of your life for the sake of his kingdom and his purposes in your life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the gift of the sacred scriptures. Thank you that you have spoken to us in a normative way through the word of God and as well you have spoken to us by means of your son. I pray for each of these in this room today, Lord, that they would allow your voice to be the dominant voice in their lives and that you would use the Holy Scriptures and this historic community of interpreters to shape them into the men and women that you desire them to be, that you might do a great work among the nations for your glory and the exaltation of the name of your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray all of these things. Amen.